This is a groundbreaking moment for sailing in Canada. Having you on the team as easily one of the most challenging, disruptive sailors, I think we can put together a team to take us to the top, Phil. And here it is, Canada's Hail GP team crosses the finish line first. I don't think a new team has ever achieved that on day one of racing in Sail GP. I want to welcome the entire Australian Sail GP team. And we want to make sure he knows what the back of the Canadian boat looks like for this season. This is the final race. Who will take home the title here in Bermuda? And I want to win. <laughs> Right now, what we're doing is gold. Every time we hit the water, we think we're going to win. The Bermuda Sail Grand Prix presented by Hamilton Princess goes the way of the two-time defending champions. Australia brings it home. It's a real belief that no one can stop us. We've just got that confidence at the moment. USA, they're the ones that grab my eye. They need to go away from this event and seriously make some changes. Welcome to Chicago, the Windy City, and also home race for USA Sail GP team. I cannot think of a better place to bounce back from their disastrous Grand Prix in Bermuda. High expectations for this weekend. And they drove 12 and a half hours from North Carolina just to see you fly. Well, it's been a few years. Hans isn't allowed to touch any ropes. Of all things to protect, it's like, don't mess with the fingers or hands. <laughs> here we go, Freds. We've got the American boat here coming out for their first bit of practice. It's a new flight controller, Hans Henken. He's in replacing the injured Rome Kirby, who's unfortunately out for this event. Well, Hans is a really, really academic guy. He has a Stanford University master's degree in aeronautics and astronomical engineering. It's great because jumping on this boat on the F-50, it just makes it really easy to understand all the systems. You know, the way the boat works, the way the engineering works, it's just, I think that gives me an upper hand. He's way smarter than most of us, so you can see the, the wheels turning in there and he comes at it with a different approach. For Hans, every minute of training counts because he's inexperienced. His job in this boat is extremely difficult to learn because basically you can't practice it anywhere else but in these F-50s. And these boats only sail on Grand Prix weekends. It's better. Well, there we go from the rookie sailor to the gold standard of flight control in the Australian Jason Waterhouse. He's the sailor who flies the boat consistently the highest. And as you know, the higher you fly it, the faster you go. Oh, everyone who tried to do like a tough, a tough maneuver, like an early drive, like the Brits and stuff, or a JK down the bottom, lost so much. Yes, Stevie. I'm sure Hans is studying Jason Waterhouse closely. So far, the American flight controller is progressing and he's improving, but he clearly needs all the practice time he can possibly get. Yeah, totally, Freddie. I mean, it's a big problem for Jimmy Spitto, isn't it? You know, right now there's a real lack of high caliber sailors born in the USA, and that's proving an issue for him. But it's not just a problem for him, it's actually a problem for US sailing as a whole. A few things have combined to, to put the United States in the position it's in. One is the other countries got more professional in their approach uh, to training young athletes and having a scheme for young athletes to work their way up. And at the same time, the United States didn't do that. Now we've got a break in practice as the Sail GP Wasp Inspire fleet is about to hit the water and we know all eyes are going to be on them. Out here now, in front of our very own eyes, could well be one of the sailors that will be the future of US yachting. One thing we know we have to do a lot of work on in the US is to build that next generation of high performance sailors. We just isn't at the level of, let's say, the Aussies, the Kiwis, potentially the British. The US has sort of been held back in terms of high performance sailing in the junior programs. Right now the US has some very talented young sailors, youth sailors, 
And I'm really thinking that maybe the US team has to start looking at this more longer term. Second leg of the last race of the day, the Canadian Gaylord Richardson has just moved up another place. Yes, Freddie, but if one guy's really shining today, it's Gavin Ball. He's 15 years old, from Hawaii. He's a friend of CJ Perez. And look, this kid's really making it look like so easy. He's dancing in the water. No mistakes, it's just incredible. It's a whole bunch of people in like my age group and also a whole bunch of younger kids that are really just sending it. I know we have the talent in the United States and I know we have all the ingredients you need. You know, you need technology, you need organization, you need elite athleticism, and you need money. Well, the focus right now is to get commercially viable. We want it to be there for the next generation. And not only that, we want it to be commercially successful. So when these kids come through and let's say get on the roster, they're making some decent money, just like a lot of the other professional athletes in the US. So we've been focusing, you know, especially my time's been heavily focused on that side, really chasing down sponsors, working with the sales team. And good news is we're starting to do some deals. Jimmy really sees this as his future and, and sees, he, he looks to Russell as somebody, possibly a mentor. You know, he's looking beyond his, his professional career now, which when you reach your, your 40s and you know, you, that, that's where your mind goes. But, but yeah, they're, they're doing a phenomenal job and long may it continue. If you think that you can run a team and only focus on the on the water results, you got another thing coming because your team could exit the league. Well, I think there's a there's a great example of that. You know, if I think if you look at the Japanese team and Nathan heavily focused on the on water stuff, really lost sight of the off the water stuff. This event's not just about results on the water. It's about you know making the teams you know financially successful as well and. That's where we're really struggling at the moment and we've been getting great results on the water but we haven't got the financial backing that we need to, to be on the start line at this weekend. There are a lot of questions around the Japanese team now and they are, uh, what I'd say is they're likely to be replaced this season so we may not see the Japanese team competing in Seoul GP again. So I'm going to introduce you to Basha, the blonde who's like okay. our, our media boat oh, okay. coordinator and okay. we have a vision that I think is going to work and be, dance. yes. Hey, Bosch, our Chicago people, we need a photo with you guys. <laughs> I handle the public relations and media for the team. You know, that is a very fine line that I try to balance just because I totally understand it's, we need to perform, but they also understand we need to deliver on the media and raise the awareness and excitement and visibility, which is going to drive sponsorship. We've got some reporters here that want to ask you about the broken leg. Yeah, the story that keeps on living. Hey, no worries. Nice to meet you. Sail GP. You, you left me hanging. <laughs> Sail GP. Everyone I've talked to is like, this was a lot of fun, and like, it was cool to see people like all up against the fences taking pictures of the boats in their hangars. I'm going to do another video while we're all here. <laughs> So it's, it's a balancing act, and I have to say it's, um, I'm really lucky that the team is willing to take one for the team, literally, when I'm asking them to get up early or stay late or, you know, pull them aside to do things, but I try to also make sure that it's really worth their time. One of the only sports I never played as a kid. You're kidding. Yeah. All-American sport of baseball? Yeah. Maybe we don't tell people that. You want to cut that out? Yeah, maybe we cut that out. Evidently, I am throwing a ceremonial pitch today, <laughs> so. Do we need to worry about you, like, blowing your arm out or something and then not being able to compete this? You know, I'm going to hold back just a little. OK, good. So that way I'm good. fresh for the racing. Good. Because, okay. uh, as you know, the pythons are my livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> Clark, do you have any tips? I mean, he's doing the first pitch. Yeah, yeah. Just Deep breathe, breath. just Deep breathe. Breath.
Welcome to day one of racing here in Chicago. Remember, three races today, two more races tomorrow, which will decide the top three boats who will battle it out in the Grand Prix final. And right now, if the home team wants to get into the final, they'd better start improving the performance because they finished the first race of the day second to last. I hope I'm wrong, but I just feel pressure is mounting on them. All the training is, is all good, and when it's racing, all of a sudden we try to do the thing a little bit too quick, you know? Race Yachts, Race Yachts, this is the race committee. Race two is about to start. And it's the start of race two. It's a great start for Britain and Canada, but look at the USA, they're at the back and they're going to have to take chances on Mark 1 or this is going to be yet another disappointing result. There's a lot going on in Mark 1. You're coming off the reach for the fastest point of the race when everyone's the closest. The faster these boats go, usually is the higher they fly out of the water, so. The leaders turn away. The USA are out the back. They set up. Campbell James first down to Lewis. There goes the board. Look at the boat here. It's flying high. It's flying too high. They're going to lose control. Here it goes now. They've done it wrong. Crash. Oh. So they've got no right to turn there. They're in. That's a foul, surely, by USA. And he's lost control of the boat. They've just lost all their speed. Both holes are in the water. This is going to take them ages to gain momentum again. The whole fleet has sailed past. The Americans are very soon going to be last after this terrible maneuver. Uh, trying to get going here. When the team set up for a manoeuvre, they're sailing around on three foils. They've got the two rudders at the back and then they've got a dagger board. So the dagger board's like an L-shape. This is the lifting surface. Um, they've got one that's in the air and to turn the boat, they've got to drop this one. All of a sudden, you go from this lifting surface to you've got two in the water. Got a pot of French. So it's my job and tax and jives to focus on the new board going down. And you know, it's, it's up to me to really hit the perfect entry angle for that board as it hits the water so that the board goes smoothly into the water, hits the lock, stabilizes, and then it will allow Jimmy to turn. So when you drop this one down, you've got to account for extra lift. And what that means is the boat just wants to launch into the sky. As the board's going in the, into the water, you know, if I give it too much lift, the boat's gonna come out of the water too high and it won't get all soaking wet. So as soon as the boat starts launching, he needs to stop it from flying. He needs to get that pepper grinder, get the boat under control while the boat's turning, hope the guys behind him are doing the right thing. But you know, there's so much going on. You've got to account for the wind and, and he's heads down. So yeah, it's just, it's super complicated. And trying to learn that in racing is almost impossible. They're missing brave. I know. I never thought I'd see myself say that. 